I'm Damien Schenkelman. I'm an engineer at Odd Zero. And I'm here to talk about our experience scaling and evolving our API. So let's do a quick show of hands. Whoever built an HTTP API here? OK, lots of people. Who has built an API that's for someone not in your company? Someone else is going to use it. You have no control of it. OK, now what happens if you build one of those, but anyone can use it? It's not like you hand it over to someone and they are doing to the client. This is global. This is for any developer out there, OK? So there are kind of three different things that no one teaches you. One of them is that documentation for any quick start, any language, any framework, is just you create a socket, you bind it to a port, call back, and you're done. That's it. That's a quick start. You know how to create APIs. Well, that's not the case. That's a very simplistic view. And the documentation then goes on and explains how you can do some things, but not what you should do. The other thing is that we developers are very devious creatures. <laughs> we break stuff, uh, whether it's intentional, it might be accidental because we didn't read the docs, we made a mistake. So we are going to mess things up. And if you are creating the API, you need to kind of be able to handle those cases. It's similar to what was discussed yesterday about kind of customer education. Devel developers are the customers of this API, so we need to educate them. And then the talk is about evolution. You're not going to get things right the first time. If you got them right the first time, it's likely that you have no users because no one's complaining. Someone's going to complain if they are using your product, and that's a good thing. You can learn from it, and you can adjust. So I'm going to go over some pillars, um, some com core concepts that we are implementing in all of our APIs. So we evolved kind of our external facing API. We are developing some new ones internally, and now we're kind of launching a new API soon. And we are introducing these concepts everywhere. And the first one is validation. And validation is your first line of defense. So it's the way that you're going to say, OK, this is not allowed. So who here validates all their inputs? This is videotape. You should raise your hand. <laughs> OK, so it's weird. But like, there are lots of things that you can do. You need to check for types. You need to check for ranges. You need to check for patterns. Lots and lots of things where things can go wrong, right? And we had this problem because we were a fast-growing startup. We were creating the product, and everything was going well. We had tons of methods in our API, and we had the server and SDKs and everything. And one of the properties was enabled, and it was a Boolean, so you could send enable true or enable 1, 1 1.0, and infamous, don't forget. That's not what it's like. You know what I mean. So that's a problem. And we were accepting that. And we needed to handle that as customers expected it would work because you are working for them. So that's not good. But these are the kind of things that were biting us. So when we said, OK, we need to improve, this is a big pain point. We need to change that. And the first thing we did is, OK, we need to introduce some sort of validation schema. And for that, we decided to use JSON schemas. The good thing about that is that JSON schemas are language agnostic. JSON is language, but you get the point. So if I wanted to move all our APIs from JavaScript to using Go and got a library that understand JSON schemas and how to validate them, I'm good. And also, I could open source this and say, hey, these are the validations that we perform. Check against those. We could do libraries that check against those on the client side. So there are lots of things that you can do with the standard. The other thing we did, and this is related to educating developers, is thinking very clearly about errors. Errors are very important. First of all, if you return errors fast without kind of going into your pipeline, that's good. You're scaling because you're doing less processing and it's cheaper. Cheap is good. So if you talk about payload to someone who's an end user, like an e-commerce user, they are not going to understand that. But you need to target messages and target errors for your audience. So you can say things like types, you can mention strings, and you even need to provide them error codes because the message is likely to change, but they need to have something that's fixed that they can act on when, you get, when they get a response. So that's what error codes are for. 
This is just an implementation detail, but the idea here is that this is a cross-cutting concern. You're going to implement this everywhere in your API, and you're going to do this for all your APIs. So you should invest time in making sure it's easy to set up. So here we're saying, okay, we validate headers, query, path, and payload. We format the errors, and that's it. This is all the code we need for, and this is working in four of our APIs. And then all we need to do is create a JSON schema per endpoint. So who is as excited as JMS when they're writing documentation? Yeah, no, no hands. So that's a problem with documentation. That's one of the problems. The other one is that it's hard to keep it up, up to date, right? If it's not something that you like to do, and then you don't tend to do it, you've already implemented the feature, you went to the bar, had a couple of drinks, celebrated, the docs aren't done, so that's not good. This happened to us a lot. This is our old API Explorer, and it looks okay. It has the methods, it has the endpoints, it has some parameters, but it was not something that we wanted to work on because you had to kind of meddle with the code. The parameters were sent in through kind of some weird configuration. You had to do everything manually, write the documentation. There were no types validation, no status code, no errors. It worked. This was the first version. This was the MVP. This got us our first customers. We were really happy about it, but we knew it needed to improve. So one of the things you need to kind of start thinking about is auto-generating docs. Developers are lazy, and they're lazier if they don't like what they're doing. If you make it easy for them to not do those things, it's better. So we say, OK, we want to generate docs. Let's use something. In our case, we use Swagger. There are other tools out there, like APRE. But the important thing is that we ended up with something similar to what we already had, but this is being auto-generated from somewhere, and it has a model, it has clear error messages, it has status code. So it's a big improvement, and we get it kind of for free. The other part of this is that you can leverage your validation logic. So we take the JSON schemas, transform them into Swagger schemas because there isn't a direct one-to-one -one mapping for those, and we get documentation for free when we implement validation. So here we know that the type is a Boolean, it's optional because there's no required, and we just put the description in there. You can even do things like provide default values so users can play around with it and give their input. This is really important. You're kind of relating these concepts, educating your users, automating stuff, and this is an evolutionary process. You don't do this all at once. So the last thing you do is you customize. First, we had the old API. It was manual. It worked. Then we created the new documentation. It didn't look as nice. And then you start to improve on that. You say, OK, how can we improve the user's experience? How can we make navigation better? It's all about like, taking steps and shipping as soon as you can to get feedback. That's really important. So another one of these kind of cross-cutting concerns, and this is becoming more and more common nowadays, is how you handle authentication and authorization in your API. And like our original API did something like this. You send your credentials to a server, you get back a token, and then you do requests sending that token in the header. That's fine, but we got more customers and they started to get requirements such as granular security, I want to do only some specific things. We started to get things like, okay, what if we aren't online and someone wants to generate a token, or what if we don't want them to depend on us? So we want tokens to be issuable without making a request. And then we get things like, okay, we need to expire things, and we wanted to kind of have non-opaque tokens, so if you have kind of your string, this is my credential, you know what it does. And that's why we decided to use JSON Web Tokens. So has, who has used JSON Web Tokens before? OK, it's a relatively nice percentage. So I'm going to go around how is this works. So OK. So this is our API Explorer. If I click Read Clients here, this changes. And I can put my key and my secret, so I just save. And then I do debugging JWTIO. I'm not going to try the internet here. I've already done this. So I get this nice debugger. This is my credential. This is what I'm going to send on each request. It's signed with secret. 
Actually, if I do secret is base64 encoded, that's what the documentation expects. It's verified. And this red part is the reverse of the base64 encoding of this. This purple part is the uh, base64 encoding of our payload, right? And here we have the identifier for my key. We have the scopes, so we know what we will be able to do. We have an issue date. We, had an, we have an identifier. And like, this is all JSON, so I could do things like, OK, this is going to expire at that point, right? So this is very easy. You can kind of create credentials on the client side without depending on the server. And as long as you are the only one that has the key, important, then the server just trusts you because it only needs to validate the signature of this. And the nice thing about it is that so we authenticate in the same way for all endpoints. Authenticating is making sure that you are who you say you are. So we just check your client ID, your key ID, and we say, OK, let's get the secret for that, check the signature. If it's good, then we know it's you, right? It's, makes sense. So that's the first part. That's fairly simple. Then authorization is, OK, now that we know it's you and we know that this token is official, we check for each endpoint something like this. So we specify. OK, these are the scopes that you require to access this endpoint. Um, again, this is specific to a particular library, but there are ways you can do this in every language. And it's very descriptive about what you're trying to achieve. It's, OK, I need these scopes to get to this endpoint. And you know that from your credentials, and you spe specify that in your documentation. So what happens, and this is, again, Bear in mind that I'm asking a question, and this is videotape. Whoever uploaded their credentials to GitHub in a public repo? Good. You're learning. So if you have done it, I'm not saying that any of you have, you want to kind of remove them or blacklist them. So since this is a kind of based on signature, and if you want to kind of make this disappear before it has expired, then you can use the ID and you say, OK, I want to revoke the token with that ID. So that's also kind of an important use case to support. We will make mistakes. Keys will get uploaded to GitHub. There needs to be a way to kind of revoke those. So this is very fast-paced. Uh, I know we all want to go to lunch, but I'm going to throw t-shirts at the audience. Yes, t-shirts. <laughs> um, I can't like, take responsibility for the t-shirt size you get. So if you like, don't like the size or the, it doesn't fit, then you can just exchange with someone else. Um, I don't have any more t-shirts. I can't do it that far because I'll hit the ceiling. <laughs> and like afterwards, if you're interested in more, you can ask me for stickers. Um, I don't have any more t-shirts, sorry. OK, so t-shirt time is over. I have made six people very happy, and the rest are just waiting for two more minutes for lunch, so that's not a good thing. Moving on. Um, OK, so this is very important. Who here has thought that when they started to build them something, they'll get a million requests per second? Yes. So you are the reason why I'm writing this. Everyone thinks that their app is going to be big, right? And so they hire a service, I don't know, Stripe, Twilio, uh, SendGrid, us, and they start to perform stress tests, right? And it's like, yeah, I'm getting a million requests per second. And you see this weird traffic from user And it's like, that's not real, probably. So you, you check and you're, okay. Stress is about DevOps. DevOps are the people getting stress. It's not about your platform. So we like our DevOps team. We want them to sleep tight. We don't want them stressed. So we started to think, OK, what can we do about this? And again, we didn't have this problem when we had a few customers. Some of them were paying, some of, the, some of them weren't. And we were growing the business. As we started to get more customers, we started to face these issues. It's not something that you're going to get at the beginning. You're not going to get to have to worry about this at first. And you shouldn't. You're trying to build a product. So rate limiting, it's simple. It sounds simple. It's just that you have to do it. So our implementation uses the token bucket algorithm, and it's kind of a distributed one. So we have many application nodes behind a load balancer, 
and they all kind of check state against a service that we are running, and it's running token bucket. Token bucket is simple. You say, okay, I have a type of token that's for each customer. Each token has a size of 10, and it gets replenished every 10 seconds with 10 new tokens. So at the most, you get 10 requests per second. This is how you configure the service. Uh, I'm showing this because you, like, if you want to use something like this, you can actually use this. This is open source. So you say, okay, customer size 10 per second 10, that's it. You start running, and for each thing that you want to kind of throttle, you just check, okay, are there any tokens in there? If there are, I'm good. If there aren't, then 429. This is your friend. You want to do this as fast as possible because you don't want to start doing operation that the other person shouldn't be doing. To provide them assistance in kind of throttling themselves, it's good if you can provide headers. Hey, this is how much you have left. This is when it's going to get full again. This is your maximum capacity. Just take that into account if you want to show a friendly message to your users. So again, we're trying to kind of scale and protect ourselves, but we have to be friendly towards whoever's using our API. Again, frost cutting concern, we use this in all four of our APIs. Any API that comes, we just plug this in, it's running. So I've talked a lot, this is a lot about like our lessons, but I really haven't gone into, okay, like how do I do it? How, how do I decide, why did you decide this? I have no idea, so I'm going to show an example of what we did, kind of conceptual. So the first thing you need to do as with everything, is admit that you have a problem. That's very important. In our case, we saw this when log looking at login distributions. So we know, like, if this is request response time from yesterday's talk, that it looks very weird. It should be kind of a normal distribution with a long tail. It's completely the opposite. This is bad. This is a problem. We have one. That's good. We can now say, okay, how to fix it? So we're running Node.js. Node.js is a single-threaded event-based service, so it handles async load well. Um, we said, okay, things are getting kind of queued, or it seems they're getting queued. Um, let's look at CPU usage, because there aren't any queues in the middle of the request lifecycle. So flame graphs, who's using them? Okay, good, it's, it's useful. So the way this works is I'm trying to take a look at which functions are executing for most of my application's time. We, who is consuming my CPU? That's basically the question I'm trying to answer. And you just sample calls in your API, so you say, okay, what ha every, I don't know, millisecond or every microsecond, okay, what's going on? What's the stack race? What's the stack trace? And you then plot this by plotting the stack traces that you sample in the y-axis, and the x-axis is for the amount of times that you've seen a particular stack trace, right? So what you get is a distribution of your CPU load. Another way to look at this is in a circle, because circles are better. <laughs> so Sunburst chart, this is in Chrome DevTools. Basically, it's easier to see like the percentage. You don't have everything on a flat line, but it's exactly the same thing. You have no new information here. So this is what you use. And it pointed to a very specific line, saying, okay, this is bcrypt compare. It's taking a lot of time. Okay, bcrypt is a function, a hash function, that's used to either hash a password with a salt and everything, or do the salt and compare that, okay? It takes, depending on how many kind of iterations you set, a long time. And that's good, because you want it to take a long time in case someone kind of happens to stumble by a password hash, they should spend a lot of time trying to crack it. So we're good. This is 100 milliseconds. All requests after this one are waiting 100 milliseconds if they landed in the same process. That's bad. That's why we had that kind of long, those long running requests. We know where the problem is now. So we start to think about solutions. The first solution that you might think of, okay, what if we use a faster hash? Well, yes, that could be an option. The thing is, we are a security company. We don't want to compromise security for just like the sake of scaling. If just 100 milliseconds for one login, that's fine. Like you wouldn't leave the page. But if you if we get hacked and your passwords get leaked because basically we're losing less strong hashes, 
then yes, we are in big trouble. And this is, depends on your business needs. This is not the only solution. This is what worked for us. So then you get, and well, everyone thinks, yeah, I'm going to cache things. The problem is two things hard in computer science, naming, cache invalidation. If you change your password and you can log in with your old one, you're going to be very pissed about it. So if we get something about this wrong, we're screwed. It's kind of complex. Also, like, what are you doing? Are you storing the p passwords directly in the cache? You don't want to do that. What if someone gets into the cache? Well, you have other problems, but passwords are supposed to be short-lived in memory. You could do kind of two-way hashing where you have a smaller hash and then a larger one, but then if you crack the smaller one, it's highly likely that you got the right password for the larger one. So there's lots of things there. This wasn't a good option for us. Then you say, okay, I'm gonna scale up. And yes, this is a perfectly fine solution in the short term. Scaling up means choose the next VM in Amazon, using it, and just adding more threads. You can use the thread pool in No, you can add more processes to the same machine. You're good. If you're trying to fix the problem, if you have it right now where you know you're gonna have it, just scale up, it's fine. That's what you should do, you fix the problem. But then you need to kind of start thinking about, okay, I'm probably burning money. I'm not crank, crack, like, cracking passwords all the time. I'm not explicitly spending all my time in that. This server is doing something else. So let's see how we can improve that. So we think, okay, we can load balance this. This is generic. We were already doing something like this. But we have the same problem. We are doing other things other than kind of checking the passwords, and we're just wasting money on those. So after we think about it a bit, we say, okay, we're going to create a service. It's vast, like the sheeps do. <laughs> and it just runs bcrypt. It's separated, it's out there, we abstract it away, we don't care how it runs. And it looks like this. Each provider connects to a load balancer. This is running random, Tyler, I'm sorry. And it just connects to those, right? It, yes, this is not ideal, but it works. And we can also scale this pretty simple because we just need to either measure amount of requests or CPU usage. Since it's doing a very specific thing, it's very easy to know, like, okay, I'm going to need more machines at some point. We, of course, were thinking, okay, like, scaling is about what you can do at scale for the least money possible. Like, no one tells you that part. So you're trying to save on that, because everyone can just build a larger machine. Well, like, Amazon has the limit, but up to that point, like, you can get very far out. But there's a huge difference between this, right? Like, you can get the same amount of requests from two of those, but they cost double or four times as much. So you should measure that and say, okay, like, what am I trying to do? Where's my money going? What am I trying to save? How many instances are, am I going to need? And this is very important. If you have a problem with the landing, at least keep your hands up. <laughs> like, you see? So, if for some reason the load balancer isn't working, one of the nodes isn't working, you need to kind of fail gracefully. So what we do if something fails there is we just say, okay, I'm going to run that locally. We don't care. If like the whole bus cluster just went down, we'll take a hit, we'll spend more CPU cycles on that, request will get queued, but our users will still be able to log in, although a bit slower. That gives us time to kind of figure out what's going on, roll out some new machines, this is very important. If you have an external dependency, it's going to fail. Know that you need to be able to handle that. So that's kind of the whole example. Um, we had a couple of laughs. That's the important part. But I'm going to kind of leave with a couple of general lessons. Um, so geo-redundancy basically means that it's not your fault, but things are going to fail. Data centers are going to fail. U.S. East, September 2015, close your eyes, that's it. It happened. Natural disasters, and bear with me on this one because it makes perfect sense. Godzilla is from Japan, right? So if it attacks the U.S., it's not going to go through New York, as the movies say. It's going to go through the West Coast. So if your data center is in California, Oregon, or Washington, you're screwed. Have another one in the East Coast, so when Godzilla attacks, you are safe. Cloud providers can also fail. Azure, end of 2014, that's all I'm going to say. So 
this is our setup. It's very complicated because when a customer sees this, they say, okay, this is good. <laughs> but, This is what it actually means. So we run Amazon on the West Coast, we run Azure on the East Coast, and if one fails, we just move to the other one. We have Amazon as our primary. There are different ways in, we can do this, in which we can do the switch. So one of them is based on metrics, like we check, okay, what's the health status for web services or a set of services? Are we getting too many failures? Are the nodes up or whatever? So that makes the switch, it's a DNS change. The other option is we go in manually. We haven't honestly automated everything. So there are situations in which we say, hey, this, is, this looks wrong. We just have to make the switch and figure out what's going on later. So you just make the switch manually and then like, say, okay, I messed up, yes. Um, like the whole point of this is like, you need to be thinking about changing. Changing is good because it means someone else has another need. So we started to think about changes using experiments. And this is based on a post that, uh, I have the link here, but it's a post from Zach Holman, he worked at GitHub, and he explains how they deploy things all the time without breaking. And the way you do this is you define an experiment in which you have kind of a control element, the kind of old implementation of something, and you have the new feature or the new implementation, and you're trying to make sure that they're always the same. So we created a library, this is for JavaScript. Uh, they have one for Ruby, which is um, a lot better than ours. It's a lot more complete, but you can do this like fairly simple in any language that you use. So you say, okay, this is the callback for my kind of success function or what I'm expecting from the old implementation. You get the one from the new function. You always return the, the value that's expected, right? You, you always want to return that, the old implementation at the beginning. And you start logging differences between the old and the new values. So you get something like this. Blue is the percentage of errors re related to 100%. So as you can see, we had some errors. It, they went up, then I started fixing bugs, then I broke some things, I fixed them. That's the idea. So once you get like green for, I don't know, two weeks, it depends on the change, depends on the load for the feature or endpoint or whatever, you say, okay, I'm good to go. I just take feature change out, and that's it. That's all I need. I've made sure that I can do this change and that it will work with a certain degree of certainty. So to wrap up, two important things I'd like to, to kind of take away. Shipping is really important. The sooner you do it, the better. One thing, and um, this is what I've mentioned throughout the talk is, okay, you get feedback from customers, you know you're doing the right thing, you're getting money from them, so you can do more things. But the other important part is that it creates a kind of good feeling in the work group. When you're shipping stuff, you kind of have a better identity, you kind of all get together and say, hey, we have a set of accomplishments, things we've done. That's a great thing, and like, that doesn't get brought up when you talk about why this is good. And the other one is remember to always look to evolve. You are going to change. If you are changing, it, you might feel the pain. When you're growing, you will feel the pain. The pain is good. It means that what you're doing is being used. And if you got it right the first time, no one would be using your product. So I'm leaving lots of links. Uh, I read this all on the plane here. So if you have links to send me for the plane back home, then that's good. Um, and that's it. Thanks a lot. Are there any questions, or is everyone starving? Okay, uh, there's one question there. Hey, great talk, thanks. Um, Thank you. We're looking at the moment to use JWT to, uh, for authorization, so authentication separate, authorization. How do you deal with uh, potentially authorization changing uh, in flight, so you have a JWT that the client has, he's firing it at your app, you, you don't want to validate it because the beauty of JWT is you, you just quickly validate, you don't have to hit a separate service to validate it. Do you, do you have to deal with that scenario? Okay, so are you kind of changing tokens as you go by? Well, well the, m maybe, maybe uh, someone has authorization access to a certain endpoint, and 
somewhere in administration that changes while his session is, is in flight. Oh, okay, yes. Um, so it's about kind of revoking access. Um, so that's an interesting problem. Um, what you want to do is have short expiration times when you issue the tokens, and then like, they'll have to renew the token, and if they already had the grant, so what you kind of remove is the grant, you say, this person has a permission for that, you click, like, okay, no more. When they try to renew that, they won't get it, and they won't be able to make requests. Um, yes, that's one of the problems with this approach. Like, Microsoft invented it, uh, and a few other large companies, to kind of avoid a database strip when they had to do authorization, because like, if you can kind of run the thing in your CPU is faster, but you kind of have outdated information or you could have that. Okay, cool, thanks. Sure.